Hey everybody and welcome to a new episode of Design Cinema. This is Feng Zhu speaking and we are at episode 96 as we stare at this blank screen here. Uh, this will be a continuation from episode 94 in which we started that whole canyon Japanese based cultural design in a, in a kind of snowy landscape. Um, so if you haven't watched it or you're joining us for the first time, uh, I recommend you watching episode 94 first. And then in 95, I talked about the whole form over function design. And today we'll reinforce that idea with, uh, with this episode. Um, before I jump into the demo and the finishing of that design, I want to go over a little bit of why we're doing this as well as all the episodes going forward, this whole form follow function. And especially if you are a student, uh, pay attention to this stuff because the industry today has changed a lot compared to when I was around in you know, almost 20 something years ago. So the requirements for portfolio has changed dramatically. And uh, I wrote a couple of blogs recently on the FCD school website, so you can go and check it out. But it's all about kind of how to play the game, the game being the industry and how to prepare your portfolio in order to get your first job. So today I'm gonna kind of just quickly uh, break this down a bit. Let me try the time here, 4, 10. Okay, so I started this in the afternoon. It's 4 o'clock, it's on a Monday. I uh, got my coffee here and uh, let's jump in and do this. So let me, uh, let's, let's, let's build this, right? So I've made a look, I'm gonna make a little chart here. So this is kind of, uh, let's on this side, let's write industry portfolio. Okay, and then this one, personal portfolio. Okay, so in the ideal world, these two things could be one portfolio. But that time has sort of gone and left. I'll say that this thing happened maybe 10 to 20 years ago. A lot of portfolios were built this way, in which you kind of just drew whatever you wanted to draw and had a lot of fun with it, and then you found a job with it. But nowadays, the industry has matured to such an advanced state, in my opinion, that if you're just doing nothing but personal portfolios, you might actually not have a chance of breaking in. Now, I'm referring to junior designers, okay? I'm referring to students who never had a job before. Again, if you're professional, do whatever the heck you want because you are working in the industry, so none of my advice really matters because you found a way in. But if you're trying to break into the business now, I'm talking about 2019 and forward, you have to be a little bit smart about what you put in your portfolio. So let's use this case, for example, this is A, this is B, right? The industry is looking for a very specific type of work, especially if you are junior. Oh, let's, spelling is hard, okay, junior, okay. Here, right, you're also a junior, but the industry is looking for a particular type of content. And to get to that, let me draw another chart. We'll come back to this one, okay, doink. Let's analyze the business a little bit. I just mentioned earlier, let's know how to, let's uh, understand how to play this game. Okay, right now it's 2019. Uh, let's just use the video game industry as an example. All right, it doesn't, uh, the film is almost the same as well, but let's just use games for now. Okay, games industry. Let's put it over here like 1995 or somewhere around here. Let's put this as year 2000 and let's talk, call this 210. Okay, so that's our little, it's not too scale right now, so to, to, uh, 1995 should be around here somewhere. Okay, you guys get the point. Okay, so this is the time span of sort of the golden period of video games in around 95. You know, it started around 90s, but 95 to the early 2000s, this time period was really a nice golden period for game development. This is where all your famous video games and IPs are established. You know, your Fallout, your Baldur's Gates, and all these kind of Deus Exes and stuff. Uh, Tomb Raider is another one, right? Uh, golden period for video games as well as for films. A lot of good IPs came out during that time period as well. So I finished school around here, 97, okay, just right here. So I was quite fortunate to enter the industry in a golden period. That means that the portfolios we're building, uh, kind of the random stuff I was drawing over at our center actually got me a job. But the same type of stuff, there's no way, there's no way the portfolio I built in 97 could give me a job today because of the maturity of the industry. So let's, let's explain that, right? So out here during this time period, during the uh, mid nineties, a lot of kind of the uh, industry pros they see today, the art directors were graduating their first time art school or design school around this time. You're looking at Craig Mullins and just a bunch of guys, I don't know, Scott Robertson, these guys, I think Robertson was like 91, 92, right? Uh, all these guys are graduating during this time. So at the time, the industry is very, very uh, basic in terms of concept design. In fact, most video games companies didn't even have concept artists as a, as a title, as a full-time job. Uh, most of the designs were being done by like, for example, the lead programmer or whoever could draw well at a time you were the concept designer for the game so during this time period in the uh, mid 90s 
you were in a very beginning phase of companies looking for artists specifically to do concept art. And uh, I was fortunate enough to land a job during this position and we were junior. Uh, how's my can't spell today, okay? We were junior in 97, 95, around that time period. But because the job was so in demand, we quickly rose up in the ranks because of the rarity of the job. So you're talking about, let's say 30 to 40, maybe up to 100 uh, designers during this time, we're all junior. But they were able to rise up in the ranks very, very quickly because of the hot trend of the industry. So they're up here, okay? So by the time we're 2019, this group or this batch of designers are now in their mid 40s, mostly, right? Mid 40s, uh, such as myself, right? We we're in our teens or late teens to early 20s, around that point, just for 20, right? So we're in our mid 40s. Some of our, my friends are even getting close to, uh, to, to uh, late 40s at this time. So most of these guys now are ADs, art directors, okay? Art directors or creative directors, pretty high ranked in the company. So now these people are in charge of a lot of IPs that's out there. From 2000, I think about 2007 maybe to about now, okay, during this time period, this last 10 years, essentially 12 years, the industries mature at a very, very fast rate in which the pipeline is now established, the type of games that sells well is kind of established, the type of genre that these games come in, like FPS, RTS, you know, all these type of third person, they're, they're established as well. And games are now a very refined product. Okay, I'm talking about triple A's, the indie side, they're always doing pretty interesting things. I'm talking about these triple A big giant studios. So the pipeline is very refined. And these students are gonna be looking for these type of people to art direct their games, to set the vision, to set the goal. They're not looking for junior designers to do that. But in the mid 90s, that was the case. I remember my first job, I actually worked at EA for my first job, it was like 97. Out of 400 something people, I was the only person with the title of concept artist. You know, I didn't even call it concept art, they call it like illustration design or something like that as my own business card. So, cause you imagine the rarity of that. So I was actually in charge with no experience. I had no experience at all but I was in charge of this IP. I worked on Wing Commander for a little bit, and then I, I jumped onto a game that never shipped. Uh, it was called Freelancer, Freelancer Online, which is akin to today's Star Citizen. Same people, so, uh, the whole Chris Roberts and those kind of guys, but they were trying to make that game way back in the days. It's like a open space, open world space simulation based on Freelancer, which was uh, uh, created by Chris over at uh, Star Citizen. So one person you know i was the only guy there drawing all the spaceships the tow ships the space stations everything because there just weren't that many people that position there's no way they'll let a junior designer do that today because these ips are worth so much money there's so much value in, you know, invested that they're gonna get these people over here Let me move the screen a little bit so it doesn't look like the uh, screen froze so they're gonna get these guys over here to art direct and run these ips so if you're looking for a job in 2019 and your portfolio all right say you're now like 20 something years old, you're in your mid twenties, right? And your portfolio content is nothing but these like world establishing things, big giant IP type of content, other worlds and these fantastical things. It's gonna be pretty hard to get you a job. Even if you're very, very good at it, it's hard because these people here, they're gonna wanna do that. Imagine you got into like a film like Star Wars. You think they're gonna let a junior designer do all the A-level ships? A-level in these films typically means a ship that will appear many, many times. It's a hero ship. It's a ship fly, flown by like Luke Skywalker or flown by Han Solo, right? All your lead characters are flying these ships. Well, guess what? These senior guys, they're gonna, they're gonna get first dibs on these designs for sure because these uh, ships are gonna become toys and they become like, uh, they're gonna live in history forever. So what does a junior designer get to do on? on this project, if you're lucky enough to get onto something like Star Wars, well, you'd be doing like landing platforms, landing uh, gears and like some joints or shoulder pads or something. You know, you're doing a lot of assistant type of work because they're not gonna give you the big IPs. So sorry about the construction outside. I don't know if it'll show up on audio, but they're building something outside. So the, the, it's kind of noisy. Anyways, so if you look at this chart, it makes a lot of sense now to plan your portfolio for a junior level position to support these uh, art directors sitting over here. So maybe, five, 10, 20 years from now, you will be the art director and we'll be all retired and out of the industry, you know? So you gotta replace us, but there's this 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 pipeline you gotta go through, okay? So a uh, few, few months ago when I was in Paris, well actually a month ago looking at Paris, looking at student portfolios, 
there was just way too much content that was trying too hard to become an art director when you're only age 21, 22. Your portfolio doesn't reflect a junior level position. And the thing is, because you lack that, uh, uh, the uh, experience, the content really wasn't done well either. It was trying to do something like Star Wars, it's trying to do these fantastical huge IPs, but the experience simply wasn't there to pull it off. So going back to this chart over here, Right, what the industry looking for is support portfolios, okay? Reference use, reference, right? Uh, fundamentals being the key, right? We want these things, oh, can't spell, right? Grounded, right? Able to do some uh, time consuming stuff, all right? Details, all right? So these are all things that your junior portfolio should have. Like you do a lot of supportive drawings, you do, you're doing a lot of referencing, you're doing fundamentals or good fundamentals. You know. uh, your designs are somewhat grounded because again, the industry doesn't make crazy stuff all the time. Most of the IPs, I mentioned this numerous times from 2018, 2017, 2016, look at the big, biggest selling games. Uh, they're all pretty much grounded. They're, they all take place on this planet. So, and also we want you to do the time consuming stuff, all the details, right? Does your portfolio showcase this? Because you're doing a personal portfolio, you might be doing these grand alien planets and these really awesome stuff, but it might not showcase this stuff. And no matter how well you draw that, you can actually hurt your chances of getting into the industry. So that's a little bit of a pre uh, tense to what I'm about to share with you guys in episode 96 of using the form over function or the uh, form follows function design to arrive at a portfolio that contains all of this. And it might be a little boring, you know, this kind of stuff. If you don't, you know, maybe you want to do the really crazy stuff, you find it kind of boring. But there's a caveat to this. If you find this kind of stuff boring, you're going to have a really hard time in the business because most of the work we do, maybe 30%, it's pretty fun. Even if you get onto a giant film like, you know, the Marvel films or Star Wars, 30% of it is pretty fun. The rest of it is just work. There's a lot of boring stuff on films and video games. You know, you look at a big game like Assassin's Creed and these huge IPs. Yes, the world together is fun but somebody has done the details to make this world come alive. For example, the, 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 the spare bedroom for, for you know, somebody, you have to put the bed, the, like the chamber pots, and someone's doing that. And that work for first week, maybe fun, second week, you're like, eh, third week, you're like, oh no, I got like four more months I'm doing like spare bedroom interior design, right? But that's work, that's what you need to do. So we wanna see that in your portfolio. And if your personal stuff, yes, you could do fun stuff all the time. But if all you have is fun stuff, we have no idea if you're able to adopt that level of interest on something that's a little bit more boring and a little bit more grounded. So it's a good idea to build a portfolio that has both, okay? It's not to say that you only have this. I'm talking about both. And this balance should be mostly this, industry-driven and some personal. You don't want it to be the other way around. Okay, so let's jump into uh, let's jump jump into this episode. So hopefully this makes sense, and you guys are always welcome to ask questions on my Facebook or YouTube regarding this. So we already spent ten minutes talking about this. So let's jump uh, let's jump in. So as a refresher, uh, where are we here? Let's open up the references that we started in ninety four. Okay, you notice I included a few new ones. Okay. So if you look back at 94, I had these rep re references prepared. So let's do a quick refresher. So the whole world is very simple. It's super cold and the population gets out of the cold by building into these canyons. And remember the formula I mentioned in 95, which is pick a culture, pick a time period and pick a function. So our culture, this is right over here, culture, right? Time period, just fill in the formula, function. Okay, that's the three that we're trying to answer. So culture, I'm using uh, kind of ancient Japan, feudal, Edo Japan, right? Time period, let's just call it uh, uh, 1600s and earlier. Okay, oops, this one, right? And the function is code, right? To get out of the code. That's all we're trying to do. And we're trying to use as much real world references as possible. We're gonna try to do 90% of it using references and 10% being made up. That's the goal we're trying to attempt with this portfolio pieces. And we'll be doing three shots. We're doing one exterior, two interiors. And that should be to sell the beginning stages of this design. So the idea here is this canyon. And we're going to build this snake-like uh, kind of tunnel system where everyone lives indoors. So there essentially isn't no more outdoor living. There's no more courtyards and you know, open spaces, everybody's living indoors to get out of the code. And hopefully that creates a visual that we've never seen before, but at the same time, we all seen it 
as well. And that's the magic we're trying to capture. And that's what we're talking about for junior uh, portfolios. Okay, so there's this reference. Uh, here's a couple other ones from the previous episodes, 94. And I include some new ones. So let's close the uh, let's close these ones for now, and I'll show you the new ones I've got. Okay. So here are the new. Let's close this as well. Save some memory. Okay. So new ones. I'm getting down to details because now we have to design this out. We ended 94 with a very very rough sketch, not enough to go to the next stage. So now I need some references that are the real references I'll be using. Uh, what I'm what I mean by real is that we're gonna try to use as much as possible the details, the props that goes inside, the construction method of the beams, right? Like we need support beams and we need interior of houses, all the little furnitures and all the little things on the walls and all this stuff. We're trying to use as much as possible. We're gonna try to prevent making things up. And this is what art directors want to see in your portfolio. They wanna see, do you have this skill? Can you adopt a culture and a design language into your work? If you could do that, then you could adopt to mostly any other language. So for example, you're working on this Japanese thing and now you go on a Western theme project. If you could show that you could adopt this language, you could probably adopt the Western theme. But imagine if your portfolio is just made up alien world, crazy space towers and whatever you want to do. Well, we have no idea if you're able to adopt to a real world location, a real, a real world time period to capture the scale, the material, right, the feeling. So that's why, again, this kind of portfolio content is so good to have your, in, your, in your work. Okay, so these are references. We'll, we'll, let's open up some of our roughs now. Okay, let's first open up where we started the first time around, which is these right over here. I should probably take a quick break. Let me pause it for real quick and come back because I don't want this to crash. I want to start again, so I'll be right back. All right, and we are back. So I opened up the uh, the really rough sketches we uh, finished or wrapped 94 with, and you can see we started with some kind of the overall plan view of this place could look like. And I did two interiors, one of like an interior of our living space and one of the hallway. Um, so looking back at this, when I started in 96, I really didn't like the overall look of it yet, especially the exterior, because it didn't capture the iconic form I was after, which is this form in our reference here. Let's open this up. Okay, like this snake-like thing. And I mentioned that in 94 as well. That's the whole point of this, uh, the iconic look, is having these kind of snaky type of buildings winding through the canyons. Looking at it here, it's like, you know what? It's it's, eh, it's kind of there, it's sort of not there. So I decided to re-sketch this. So to save some time, I already sketched all this out. Actually, I finished this project already. So I'll go through step-by-step step of how I did it. Because actually, in reality, I tried to record this episode the last week and my freaking computer was crashing left and right. I had no idea why. I was on a PC actually, and the thing was just crashing every five minutes. So I gave up. I just decided, you know what? I already made the time for it. So I finished the project without recording it, but uh, I saved all the steps. So you guys can take a look at it here. It doesn't matter. We're talking about design here. I mentioned the process numerous times already, so I don't think it matters if you don't see how it's done. Uh, the more important thing is see how these designs using function over form uh, could result in a pretty cool portfolio without you doing much work at all. You know, really, that's a, that's a pretty important thing here. So let's go back and look at some of the sketches I've done after this. Okay, so here, let's open these up. So I did this last week. You can see how crappy these are. Let's open this up just to show you the difference here. So I redrew these now i'm using a perspective grid you can sort of see inside here there is a grid okay um the reason why i use a perspective grid is because i'm about to go into 3d with these and it's up to you you can actually go into 3d without drawing these nice which i mentioned many times as well you could draw these super rough as long as you understand that's fine but if you want this to be like very well matched when you transition to 3d then by using a perspective grid, I'm pretty sure I could capture this camera in 3D. Because if you know your fundamentals and you have a perspective grid, then your foreshortening and your composition should be able to be matched directly in 3D, or very, very close. You should be able to match about 85 to 90% of what you sketch in 3D. Uh, if you don't do that, then you have to re kind of establish the camera again in 3D. So you might miss the composition or the design. So here I elected to use a grid just to make sure I could capture the overall design. So let's go over these real quick. Let me close, uh, let, I'll leave these one open, but you could kind of sort of see a compare here. So this was the previous episode 94. You can see that everything felt too wide, too open. And everything was kind of more of a village versus a snake tunnel effect. So the first thing I did was to try to get that snake tunnel. And I know it's a little bit hard to see here, but let's open up this to the full screen. Um, using the perspective grid, 
I decide to lower the camera just a tiny bit so my horizon lines over here so that way I could get this kind of very forced one-point perspective to get the tunnel effect going that's the first thing second by pushing the camera to a pretty wide angle lens I'm able to fit these long houses in this perspective to try to capture that snake feel and even though this is rough i had a pretty good idea of what's happening here i was quite happy with it and in fact i will draw on top of this that you'll see soon in which we clean this up just a little bit to get the details going but this was enough i drew this i go you know what this is right this is the thing i want so you can see here here are the canyons on both sides and we have these kind of let me make sure i'm not different layer okay uh, we have these buildings uh, on top here let me check the time. I'll always make sure we do. Okay, I think we're okay. All right, so that's the first sketch. Once I've done this, I'll say, okay, let's do the interior hallway drawing, which is the one over here. Another super rough sketch. You can see the uh, the grid underneath is all messy and stuff. But I knew what was happening here. So I wanted like a uh, roof, right? A secondary roof here. So we have an opening here and another opening here to allow the light to come in. We have this, again, one strong one point perspective to give us a tunnel effect right because i want to capture that whole tunnel system because we are in a snake kind of environment here and then to the left and right we have the interior spaces and i open up the camera just a little bit here to allow for exterior shot so we could have a person coming in from the left and he could perhaps wipe screen and walk into the right uh this is close to the rough sketch i've done uh the previous week which is over here well episode 94 which is here because see here this shot was just too open it wasn't dynamic enough so and i also do these without any kind of grid or anything like that so with a with the camera on top it it helps tremendously to set the grid uh, to set the camera into the right position so this is my rough for the interior and then i did one more rough here you can see for one of the housing interiors so let me explain here what's going on here so the here out here will be the walkway so you can sort of see out to that uh, walkway here and here's the interior we have like a kitchen area where they do the cooking and then we have an upper stage here where they could do the sleeping and also maybe a shrine of some kind over here uh, I imagine these people will be uh, mostly hunter gatherers right they live in this cold environment and during the day when it's slightly warmer they go out and hunt for uh, rabbits and deers and furs and wolves and so forth and at night they come back here into the shelter so it's pretty much like a Japanese culture based village except the location and the architecture is slightly different 10% right we just altered it slightly and that should give us a new visual style but it's extremely relatable and uh, you know I repeated this a hundred times now that's the whole point of these portfolio pieces for art directors to see for them to see that you're, you have the skill to adopt real world things and make it more entertaining okay so let's open up the uh, the slightly cleanup version I'll leave this here so you can see that there my cleanup version is drawn directly on top of these roughs because again, these are not gonna be the final drawings. So it doesn't matter if my sketches are rough. Let me open these up one more time without the notes, right? So here are the first pass. Let's open up the second pass. Boom, boom, boom. Okay. And let's match these up. So here is the exterior. So you can see it's the same drawing, all right? It's the same drawing. I didn't like draw it again. I just drew right directly on top of the, this rough here. So let's, uh, let's look at this one. So here is the exterior shot. And I like this one it's capturing exactly what i wanted which is like looks like two or three snakes twisting in this canyon bending like over here right like a snake just swimming across right that's captured it uh so i'm pretty satisfied with this design i think he, uh, it met the design goal i was set uh, setting for myself when i did that reference image and this sketch is enough to go to 3d my proportions are somewhat figured out uh, the overall layout I'm happy with and the camera in terms of how I'm selling this environment is starting to work as well. So these are essentially long houses that has a uh, window here and another window here. So if you cut this profile, you can see the profile of this. Right, let's draw this a little bit better. It's something like this. So on the other side, boom, boom, right? So that's like a cross section a slice of what this environment looks like so all i gotta do is replicate that in the interior so we've got two areas for light to come in so i'll open up the second space mainly to allow light to come in and also it's all from references as well uh, you'll see how i put this together with references in a second here so let's look at the next one let's look at our hallway uh, which should be this one okay so let's look at the initial hallway here is the sketch and once I was satisfied with the camera and everything, I went in and just did a little bit more work on it. Super quick sketch. This is all for yourself. There's nobody else gets to see this. You know, this is when you're doing this, the end result is going to be, in my case, using 3D to finish it. 
so I didn't really worry about how nice this drawing was because in the real reality, in the real world, nobody will see this. So, um, and this process was quite quick. I did all these sketches in a matter of, I think all three were done within an hour. So, because if you have a good design, good references, that's the whole point of it. It saves you a ton of time. I don't have to go invent the architecture. Uh, architecture. I don't have to invent the culture. I don't have to invent what's inside these homes. I don't have to invent the material, the structure. I don't have to invent anything. I'm simply lifting all this from references and restructuring it to be slightly different. Okay, uh, later I'll show you the references used for these and you'll see what I mean. So this space now is uh, kind of uh, sketched in. I sort of know what's going on here. So these are like maybe shops on the left and the right side. Uh, these people are probably pretty poor. So their wood beams and stuff is not perfectly built. Um, you can see that I also try to indicate a little bit of light coming in from the left here to just break the space up by having some nice light shafts and stuff and all the stuff that video games are so good at these days. Uh, real time lighting and ray tracing and all that kind of stuff is now being put into all your next gen games. So we want to add as much as that as possible. And polygon count is not a big deal these days. So you can put as much details as you want. Most of these game engines can pull that off. Uh, in fact, they don't really care. Nowadays, you can put a ton of stuff and uh, they make you upgrade your, your, your video cards in only order to run these games at 4K. Uh, anyways, so here's the uh, interior. And uh, let's look at the, the home interior. So let's, uh, oh, got too many things open here. Uh, let's put these to the bottom and here is the initial sketch for the home interior. And here is the kind of the slightly cleaned up version of the interior, still pretty rough. But you can see that we have our little cook, uh, cooking area, the little kitchen area, lights coming through here. And we have all the little gadgets, all these baskets and all these type of things on the walls. Uh, and here we have like the uh, towards camera, we have a sleeping quarters uh, with a little shrine. And I'll show you the references I found for this kind of stuff, it's all pretty cool. Uh, and all that stuff now is put in place. So the next thing to do with these is to add references so we know, or we'll try to use as much real world things as possible. So let me show you that, let me close these guys up. Yeah. I'll post all these to um, uh, the school's website later. So you guys can see these in, uh, uh, take your time and look at them or download to your computer and uh, play with it and do whatever you want with it. Okay, so let me open up the references before I show you the stage in which you move to 3D. Boink, boink, boink. Okay, uh, let's start from here. All right. So here, once the sketch has uh, been drawn, now I want to include as much photo reference as possible all from the real world so we could borrow from culture and we could borrow from history and don't have to make stuff up. Remember, that's so important. If you're a junior designer, don't make up culture. You don't have to experience for it. Or very few, maybe some of you could do it, but very few can make up a whole culture by yourself. If you're 20 years old, how do you make up a few hundred year or a few thousand year old culture on your own? You don't need to do that. In fact, these big video games don't do that. They're using Egypt, they're using Greece, they're using Vikings, right? They're using all these things to make up the world. Do the same thing in your portfolio. So you can see here, the snake winding thing is so important. So I'm using the roof designs here. Oh man, the outside uh, construction is so crazy. But anyways, I, I just checked the audio, it seems okay. Uh, anyways, so to see the towers being here, like how these staircases work, just straight up put the photos in there and tell yourself when building this stuff out in 3D or you're gonna draw this nicely, use it as is. Look at this um, beam I found online, right? It's like a museum in Japan, shows you how their structures were built. It's like, you don't have to re-engineer this. This stuff is great. Look at the way they put a little house at the tip of this kind of stuff. And we'll be bringing all this into our final image because it's all free, it's all cultural. You don't have to make up anything and all this stuff makes sense and you get all these details and structures all for free. No copyright issues, history has no copyright, there's no uh, infringements on culture, you know what I'm saying? All this stuff is, you know, free to use, um, so use as much as possible. So let's look at the interior. Uh, here's the uh, here's the first interior, right, that hallway. So you can see, again, I want these uh, rooftops and interiors to be a little bit more worn. I don't want perfect wood. I don't want this place to look like it was built yesterday. It should look like something that's been there for 50, maybe to 100 years, like quite old. So I'm choosing references on purpose that have a lot of aging to them. Right? Look at the way the wood beams work, not so perfect, right? And all these things are raised above the floor. I love the textures going on here on this floor tile. And uh, here's some props that could possibly go in there. 
uh, things on the wall. So these are hunters. So once they go in, uh, don't go in their house, they probably hang their clothing and all their hats and all that kind of stuff on the walls uh, before they venture forth into the interior spaces. So that's this one. I drew a quick profile here. You can see sort of what the longhouse look like. So we have the hallway here and we have the uh, living spaces here. This one, the proportion is slightly off. This one should be probably a little bit more narrow. Uh, this space here is a little wide. So ultimately in 3D, we squeezed it down to about here. So that way the hallway is not the same width as the houses, which doesn't look that, that good uh, when we build it out. So we just squeezed it in a little bit. Uh, but this will give you a rough idea of how these houses are made. Let's look at the last interior here. Okay, so plenty of references for Japanese, uh, you know, feudal Japan, Edo Japan, plenty of references online. So you don't have to make up anything. And all these details, we used about 80 to 90% of these things in the final, uh, which we could later break down to show you. So you can see great stuff. Look at this cutaway. It tells you exactly how it's built. So you don't have to come up with anything. You know, it shows you how the wood structure is built. It shows how the roof work. It shows you the inner beams, how that works. It shows you the, uh, the interior uh, structural elements, the kind of props that's inside. This is perfect. This is how you build these AAA games nowadays. And this is how you uh, work on period piece of films. You want to use these references. You don't want to be making stuff up because then you'll kind of go off tangent and making up your own world, uh, which easily could become a mistake if you don't know what you're doing. So look at this, look at all these references. They're great. They're so nice, all, right, all for free. All these kind of historic pieces. Put that all in here and you're good to go. Uh, here's a little shrine I found. I don't know what this was, but it's pretty cool. It looks like something straight out of Tomb Raider, but it was real. So you got this Buddha statue in this kind of metal canister. I thought that's great. That's a prop that's not so common, but it is from history. Let's show the viewer that, right? And this is how we create entertainment. So I remember um, even reading on Reddit, a lot of younger kids are saying they, they learn more uh, history from playing video games than they're learning from their classes in school because these games are putting so much History in terms of visuals, I don't know if their story is correct for a lot of these video games, but at least the visuals, a lot of them are actually very accurate. I mean, look at Notre Dame, right? Two weeks ago, they had the fire on the roof, and everyone was playing Assassin's Creed uh, Unity to look at the structure because even for a video game, game company, they spent, I think, two years building that thing. So we're talking about a lot of history, a lot of reference being used in entertainment, and that is something we do to entertain people because we haven't lived in Paris in 1800s. We haven't been in England in 1800s. So creating this world and retelling it uh, using the visuals of that time period is just as entertaining as making up your own world. So as a young student, you have to fight that urge to make it my, make it my own. My stuff has to be different. My stuff has to be different from everybody else. Well, when you do that, you're just alienate yourself probably from the job position because in the real world, we're building products that are grounded to reality. They are grounded to history. They are grounded to culture. So um, I repeat this enough already in episode 95, but uh, it's something as an art director who work with junior designers all the time and hiring people, this is something I'm seeing a huge trend in these days. Uh, you know, and the, I think it started about three, four years ago in which so many portfolios are just going way off tangent to what the industry wants, you know, just kind of way out their content. So I'm, I'm, I'm recording all these episodes to hopefully help you guys. And, you know, you don't have to listen to me. You don't have to believe me. But uh, we have a school that has a track record for this. We have a lot of students in triple A's. And you look at the portfolios, like they don't, sometimes they don't even draw that well, you know what I'm saying? But the content is totally fitting for their first job. So they get into these triple A studios and work in these IPs. And if you want to draw your own portfolio, do all you want once you go home. You know, at least you have a job in the industry. Then you can work your way up and slowly uh, raise your position. So uh, anyways, let me close these references. Now let's, we should look at the, uh, the beginnings of the 3D. So let me pause one more time to prevent crashing and I'll be right back. All right, and we are back. I think uh, I uh, stopped it because my computer was getting super, super laggy. So I was afraid it was gonna crash. I have no idea what's going on with Camtasia. Uh, but anyways, let's open up some of these work in progress to show you a bit of how we move into 3D. So let's open up the exterior first. Okay, so you can see based on the rough, we went to 3D and blocked out. Let's open up the uh, the rough version of these. So to compare, actually, you know what? We're gonna open up the uh, reference versions instead because we can see exactly how the real world stuff was added to these. Okay, so we're looking at the exterior. Let's hide these, we don't need these. All right, so here's this one, and here 
are the shots matching that? Which one's first? I think uh, this one should be first. Okay. So you can see how closely we are matching the camera angle. Let's make this big so you guys can see it. Okay. So we have now captured the whole uh, twisting snake thing going on here in the house. We made sure that the architecture, the cut line is correct. So we have this kind of the same type of structure that we uh, talked about. You can see that it goes like that. So that way our exterior and our interior matches. We definitely don't want an exterior that doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't fit the interior space. So we made sure the scale is correct, uh, putting, uh, putting some dummy uh, figures to hold the uh, space. But I was pretty happy with this. This is exactly what I was going for when we first started episode 94. You know, this kind of twisting cannon type of thing. Um, you can see the details here. Let's just zoom in. Let's make this a little bit brighter so you guys can see. Oops, wrong layer. Let's make it brighter, brighter, brighter. Okay, so you can see all the details. You can see we lifted these directly from here. All right, that's what I mentioned about using references. Look at that. So we use the same type of structure, right? These little house things are a little small. We actually end up making it a little bit bigger. Uh, but just lifting all the details, all the support beams on the bottom, the rooftops, right? The outer structures of these things are all from references because don't make stuff up if you don't have to. This design is really wild enough. You know, having these twisting tunnels uh, in a, a canyon is really good enough. That is something that did not exist. So you don't have to make up the rest of it. So you can see how useful this will be in a video game or a film in which you're creating something new, but at the same time you recognize it, okay? Let's take a look at the, uh, another work in progress here, right? So this one's slightly being fixed up. Um, but still messy. Actually, this is the first version, I believe. So you can see this a little more ancient. Let's open up sort of the three-quarter view so you guys can see what these things look like when they were being built. All right. Here's some down angle shots just showing you the uh, the 3D layout of uh, what these could look like. So you can see we just built enough to convey the idea. The whole point is to get this sold and then we'll go off and uh, do details of it later if the client is happy with it. But we still figure stuff out. You can see here, you know, how this stuff goes around the canyon, the whole snake idea, right? It's like a bunch of cobras uh, just going in and out of this canyon. Uh, here's another angle of it. Let's make it bigger, right? So I really like the way this feels. I mean, it's, uh, it's doing its job and going to 3D really helps with that because it helps us to figure out exactly what the design is. Our scale is correct, our camera is correct, All right? So let's close these real quick. Let's close this one as well. Let's look at the interior spaces, uh, which should be boink, boink. So you can see here, that's the uh, tunnel. So I think this is version one here. Not too much difference here, uh, but this is version one. So let's make it a big, so you can see. Uh, got the rough architecture figured out. It's matching our design here, which is uh, this one over here. All right. So you can see it's very close. So by using the grid to draw my initial sketch, you can see how closely we can match that in 3D because the grid is essentially 3D, except we're manually drawing it in. But the foreshortening is uh, is real. The foreshortening of the grid is the same foreshortening as the camera. So you can see we match the camera pretty much about 80%, right? 85, uh, almost 90% exactly what we want. So this is the benefit of knowing some fundamentals that you could draw on top of a perspective grid and moving to 3D and ensure that pretty much the shot is the same. Uh, if you are kind of roughing a 3D, I mean, you're drawing and you don't make your proportions accurate or for short and accurate, then you have to adjust it in 3D. So in either case, it's all fine. You don't have to make your sketch nice. You can make it super, super loose just for yourself and you can always adjust it in 3D. But uh, so this is initial pass and this process is very, very fast. Going to 3D usually takes less than a day. We're talking about maybe uh, four or five hours because the heavy user reference. I mean, look at this stuff. It's all reference. See the floorboard here? the way the wood looks, the, uh, the, the uh, beams, it's exactly the same here. We're just straight up referencing, right? All the props, like these, uh, these things blocking uh, the view. I think in episode 94, we actually looked at those before. So I'll show you the folder of all the references. You just can see how big it is. Uh, let's see, let's go ref. All right. Here are my references I gather for this project. You can see these are independent. I haven't chopped them up into, uh, into one single sheet. But you look at all this stuff in here, right? And you can see all these materials working its way into the final design, uh, especially all the props, right? All these things hanging, like look at all this stuff, right? You can actually see, whoops, this is uh, not in Photoshop. Let me open this in Photoshop. So you can actually see this type of, these type of props start to show up inside here, like all these little jars and look at these little tables, right? They're all the same things. 
So uh, I think I repeated it enough for now. But uh, again, use those references when you're making culture and history. Let's look at the pro progress of this one here. Let's close that one. All right, here's uh, being worked on a little bit more. We're uh, breaking up some of the patterns. So before, those walls were too clean. Uh, so we added some uh, uh, thatch, kind of like grassy material to just to cover it. Added more props in here. Again, all referenced. Uh, so these guys are kind of like they have shops and living spaces on the left and right of uh, this area right? And the, we open the door here to indicate a kind of a cold environment outside. So we also have a one two three in terms of composition. Okay um, Let me close this Okay, I'll show you a little bit of what that shall look like in rough 3d All right, So here it is the 3d model built. This is the hallway from a different angle So you can sort of see how rough these 3d are So a lot of it was done in Photoshop in terms of the texture work the lighting and color the 3d is just it's just roughed in But it's enough to hold the camera position and it's enough to check scale so you can see that our, our home here It's the same. Here's the second roof as the exterior. All right, we actually use the exterior as the base to do the interior. So we make sure that if this does go to production, we are using the correct scale. So we don't drive like the art directors crazy when they approve the exterior and the interior does not match. Yeah. Uh, here's the housing. So I'll keep that open while we open up what this looks like. So this is a uh, four. I think that's the, oh, not this one. Boom. All right. So here's a work in progress of the second bedroom minus the people, right? So you can see that's the, this is the 3D for it. So a person placeholder, uh, placeholder to hold the scale and then all the uh, proportions are measured out uh, All the things are roughed in like the kitchen and here is what it looks like with some textures added on top But still not final. This is all work in progress uh, But look at all these references all these things on the walls, right? Look at these uh, these clothing the tools this kind of thing that blows a uh, hot air You know what blows air uh, if we could go back you can see it's all in here. Look at this. It's right here this thing is right here. We could actually play a game in which we could try to find every single reference uh, in the uh, uh, in the 3D. You can see all of them are here. All right. So hopefully this is starting to inspire you guys to look at the real world with a whole other perspective to it versus like I always do something different. I always have to make up a world. Uh, again, that time has gone. It's passed, and it's probably not returning for a while in terms of the the let's call it the Renaissance or the uh, you know the golden age of concept design that has gone it passed about 10 years ago now we're in a much more mature market and if you want to go in as a junior designer this is a skill that you have to have now which is building things off the real world and making it kind of cool in fact i mean this japanese thing didn't they come out with that game from uh, from software uh, i forgot what it's called like say, say toko or something like that i haven't played it yet it's that crazy hard game from uh, from software i haven't played the game so i haven't seen too much of it but i know their world is in japan but it's not real it's like a fantasy japan but look it's the same type of stuff using culture to create a fantastic world that you want to play in and you understand but at the same time it's slightly different so you can see how many game titles out there are doing this right oh here's that little shrine look <laughs> uh, we put this in as well right? it's the same that metal canister i showed you earlier so i thought it was a cool design so if a player actually sees this They'd be like, hey, that's pretty interesting. And that you could look it up and uh, find out where it came from. All right, so put a little shrine. Because uh, these people uh, were talking about some heavy cultural things, some religious things here. Putting as much of that as possible to make this world more deep, to make the world more believable. Yeah. So let's show you guys the finals of these. So these are all the work in progress and all the references. Um, I'll put these on my website later so you guys can see these in detail. Okay, so uh, let's open up the final. And this episode should be wrapped up pretty quickly. So we're gonna move forward to uh, 97. All right, so boom, boom, boom. All right, so here are the final ones with some people and stuff added, a little bit more detail. So here's the snowy landscape version. Uh, let me make this a little brighter. So I'm not sure how dark it is on, on YouTube. All right, let me just make it a little brighter. So you can see here the roof is kind of got snow on it. It's got this snake effect. It's got that shine too. I really want to capture that shine. You know, like cobras at a certain perspective. The back of the cobra has this sheen so i actually wanted to capture that in these roof tiles because of the snow and the sunlight we might get the same sheen right so it really looks like giant snakes uh going in and out of this uh this canyon uh indicate a little bit of sunlight here hitting on the upper right corner with these guard towers uh so these guys are keeping watch uh, and then we got some little, little samurai guy here on the left here just watching out So you can see that this world is very very fitting for a uh, v Video game environment or a film environment. Uh, you could you could uh, jump around the top of the roof You could go inside and run around the inside. It's great for RPG 
let's go for an action kind of a, of a game, like a third person action fighting game. It could be like a Witcher type of game. You watch, you're walking around, right? So the world feels refreshing, but at the same time, it is not. It is so grounded to Japanese culture, just used in a slightly different way. So even these railings were referenced, like they're all built in 3D, but they're all referenced from the real world, like how these things work and. You know that they're uh, they're what you call the forms or referenced right so this is all functional over form these entire buildings obviously they have some artistic things to them but this design was born out of function to fit a living space within canyons gave us this particular result and uh, you could practice this at home by giving yourself a uh, some kind of challenge remember pick culture time period function right put that in uh, in that in that water and then try to design something so I'm going to show you the interior Here's the hallway, right? So we put a lot more people in here. So you can see this long tunnel, tons of props everywhere. These guys are like selling things, sewing things, you know, that life goes on, you know, even the life is harsh here, but it goes on. People have to live and they have to shop and people have to make a living, right? Uh, play with the lighting a little bit to have this kind of sparkly sunlight coming in. I imagine in here it could be a little bit more warm. So they're burning a lot of fires and it's wood, so it keeps the heat in here. So uh, we went for this kind of, a, still kind of a comfort uh, comfortable feeling. So it's not such a harsh, harsh condition once you're inside uh, as compared to outside, which you know didn't have too many people at all. It's pretty cold out here. Um, so here's the interior. So uh, let's zoom in just to see a few more details here. Selling some dry meat, like deer meat. Uh, very J Japan, you know, um, kind of this crackly wood material, a lot of thatched uh, hay type of materials, netting, uh, a lot of prayer type stuff, religious symbols, jars, you know, people wearing huge fur coming in after a day out in the, uh, in the wilderness. Okay, let's look at the third piece here. And we're almost done. So here's our housing interior. So the goal here is to sell what everyday life is. So these three shots give us a very good transition from outside to the first inner space to the final, final inner uh, sanctum of this space. So generally three pieces is enough to sell a particular environment. When you're working on projects, we actually do this in the real world. So for a new environment that hasn't been uh, proved out in concept, or in terms of like approved to go into a particular uh, product, we generally do about three shots just like this to sell this to the client, to for us to have a discussion, right? For example, these three shots didn't take too long to do. They took most about two days, two 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 and a half days to do all three of them. So it's a very short time period. So by say you start this on Monday, you're done by Thursday, you know, Wednesday night, you're done. So by a Friday meeting, we could decide if this environment is useful or not. If it's not, we, we lost three days, no big deal. We, we'll start it again. And if it's good, then we'll continue driving this forward with a lot more details, right? So uh, this is very typical of what my studio do, uh, our speed uh, as well. So just to show you guys, if you're a junior designer, what the timeline is in particular creating this. But again, if you're doing this uh, on your own, uh, which we call it as a student, take your time. This could take you a week to do, maybe take you two weeks. Go for quality, go for good design. Don't rush this kind of stuff, make it look nice. Um, Look at this stuff, right? So let's go back and zoom in. Like this pipe, this metal thing with this thing holding, all from reference. This kind of stuff, it's so hard to make up because you know we didn't invent this stuff. We were not around in 1600s Japan, you know? How could you make up things when the reality already gives it to you? And it's so cool. I mean, uh, you have to really look at the reference, go see like, hey, they put a metal piping or some kind of bamboo pipe uh, on the outer uh, perimeter of this metal beam, you know? So, and you learn stuff by doing this. Uh, you learn about how things works in the real world. Uh, so yeah, more things hanging, little jars, right? uh, some uh, religious things, there's that shrine again, uh, some, some uh, ceremonial type of things. So yeah, so these are the uh, three shots that we started in 94, and here they are, finished. Um, hopefully this gives you a good insight into building this type of portfolio. Imagine you do this, another three more shots like this, you know, a couple more spaces, maybe like a, uh, a leader's room, you know, like a king or an emperor, like what this room looks like here, maybe a barrack, right? Like if I continue this project, I'll probably do that. Like a barrack will be very good. A, uh, a, a important person's room will be important because those are things that a video game will want to see in this environment because you're ultimately going to some kind of destination in most video games. You're going from A to B to C to D and finally the pay off room. So right now we're doing kind of generic where the space is your pass, but we don't have the actual destination. So that's probably something I'll do if these environments were approved by client. But since these are just made up stuff, we'll just stop it here. So in 97, I have no idea which one we'll pick, but we'll pick something from episode 90, 95, right? 95, you know, all those themes I mentioned. We'll pick something, we'll do it again, we'll do some roughs, 
or build it out so you guys could see that these ideas could completely be realized and make really fun portfolio pieces that are very much hireable if you're looking for a job. So um, yeah, so hope you guys enjoyed this episode. It's a little bit shorter than usual. And uh, look for these images on the FCD Schools blog if you want to take a closer look. Any questions, forward it to me on Facebook. And uh, yeah, thanks again. And I'll see you guys in episode 97. This is Feng Zhu signing off. Bye-bye.